Great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me get my screen up here uh, and start sharing with you. Um, we can get the show rolling here. Uh, hopefully that works for everyone. I'm sure one of the moderators will let me know if it if it's not showing up well. But I uh, want to thank everyone, especially those at the Geological Society of Minnesota for having me tonight. I appreciate all the great work they do for geologic education and helping uh, get the Earth's great stories and tales uh, out to the general public. Our title tonight is Volcanic Features and Highlights of Southern Idaho. Um, and so I wanted to start with this image here, which is the, the cover of one of my books that uh, artist Eric Knight put together and kind of a, an apocalyptic looking kind of scene here. This is actually the, the Snake River Canyon here in Twin Falls and the, the bridge over the canyon. And this shows what a potential future volcanic event in this region might look like. Obviously it's a little bit of eye candy, um, you know, kind of embellished maybe a bit uh, just to make it look a little uh, more exciting. But this is actually not just a look into our potential future, but also into our past. And I hope to share with you tonight, not just some uh, great information about the geologic history and the volcanic history of Southern Idaho, but also maybe entice you a little bit into visiting sometime soon uh, and maybe putting some places on your radar that you might find interesting and, and engaging. Um, so I'll go ahead as I try to explain some of the geology in Southern Idaho. I want to make you aware of a couple of resources that I've had the good fortune to be involved with. I think they mentioned the books that I've been involved with. The first book I put together in 2017, and this is part of a series that Mountain Press Publishing in Missoula, Montana put, has put together. So you might notice the titles uh, look a little bit familiar, but there's the Geology Underfoot series, um, which highlights uh, 23 different locations throughout Southern Idaho, giving you a little bit more information about where to go, <clears throat> what to look for, and then ultimately explaining the geologic history of that particular location. Uh, it's called Geology Underfoot because it's meant to get people out of the car and more engaged with the landscape. Maybe it's a, a road cut, maybe it's a, a trail or a vista, um, but definitely getting people outside and looking around into some different areas of uh, in this part of the state. And then the other uh, book that we just had published last, I guess two years ago now, 2021, uh, is the Roadside Geology series, which is probably a little bit more, uh, you're probably a little bit more familiar with. I think they've got most of the country covered. There might be a couple of states left, but we, uh, we meaning myself and two other geologists, put together this new edition, recognizing that the first edition was about 30 years old. A lot more information had come to light about the geology of Idaho. And so we put this together all in full color, nicely illustrated by uh, Chelsea Feeney, who's done a lot of great work with the, the roadside geology series. So just putting it out there is a nice resource if you're interested in more information about Idaho geology, or if you're coming out here, maybe driving through on a visit. Uh, and then the next thing is, the, as they mentioned in my, in my bio, the last few years, I've, I've realized that a great way to connect with people in terms of educating them about geologies through YouTube and through videos. And so the pandemic kind of forced my hand when I was looking for ways to connect with my students and get the, the field trips I'd meant to take them on, kind of bring those field trips to them. Um, I started playing around with some YouTube videos and it kind of just steamrolled from there to the point where now um, I've got like a, a nice little modest following of people who enjoy my take and my explanation of the geology of different places I travel to. So it's kind of a fun thing to do. It's something I just kind of do on the side when I'm out traveling or uh, doing my own little geologic exploration and research. But you might check that out, out as well, especially because a lot of the places I'll talk about tonight, uh, I've featured previously on, on these videos. So if you want a little bit more in-depth story, maybe some more visuals than what I'm just sharing tonight with this with this presentation, you might try going onto that, that YouTube site and kind of and looking at, at that and checking that out. So, um, okay, so let's get started. So as I was putting this together, I actually kind of had like a, probably a five minute rabbit hole diversion, just thinking about Idaho and Minnesota. And I've, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit that my only experience in Minnesota was flying through the airport on my way to Iceland. Um, but I started thinking about the two states a little bit and just did a quick little compare contrast. We're, we're two states away, so we're, I guess we're kind of neighbors, although the two states between us are quite large. 
Um, <clears throat> we're actually pretty similar from north to south in our dimensions. Idaho's a little bit taller or a little bit longer, I guess, from north to south. Uh, but Minnesota is a little bit wider from east to west. Uh, we both share a border with Canada. We're both at approximately the same latitude. Um, but that might be where some of our similarities kind of end. We've actually got quite a bit of differences when it comes to the geology, when it comes to the topography, uh, the climate, although we're both kind of maybe a snowy mess right now. So maybe we have that in common. Um, but I thought that was just kind of an interesting uh, just kind of connection between Minnesota and Idaho. So my first thing I want to do is, is kind of orient you a little bit with Idaho, get you familiar with the complete, the whole state, both geologically and, and what we have here uh, to offer people who are interested in our geology. And then we'll focus mainly on the southern part of the snake, and in particular, this area we call the Snake River Plain. And so if we look at Idaho, just kind of stretched across your screen there, um, this is kind of like a, a snapshot view of of what's going on in Idaho. So we've got lakes and forest in the north, um, a really pretty kind of uh, topography and just scenery to the north. Uh, rolling hills, this is the Palouse region here uh, where the rolling hills are, are shown. We've got big canyons along the western margin through Hell's Canyon and some of the big canyons of the Snake and Salmon Rivers. Um, the biggest impediment in, in Idaho are these huge mountains that just sort of sit right in the middle of the state. Uh, they prevent us from having any sort of freeway system that goes north to south. And there's such a, a topographic and uh, significant obstacle that we actually have our time zones are, are, are separated. We've got the northern part of Idaho on Pacific time and the southern part of the state on mountain time. Uh, and then you get down to the southern part of the state. And this is where most of the population of the state is down here in the Snake River Plain. Lots of farms. Agriculture is a big business. A lot of the cities and towns are down here. Uh, and then as you head down towards the border with Nevada and Utah, uh, it's it's kind of a, a vast desert uh, dominated by sagebrush. So we're we're really quite a diverse state. Uh, I like to joke with a lot of people, but especially my, my Montana friends, that that this little chunk here would make a nice addition to uh, Idaho and would help us maybe have a, a more rectangular shape instead of this sort of trademark uh, zigzaggy shape along the continental divide here and along these mountain crests. So we'll see if that ever comes to pass, but um, that would be nice, at least from my perspective. So if we look at Idaho geologically at the different provinces, we have different parts of the state that have very different geologic histories. Um, the topography is different as we've, as we've talked about. And this is from our book, Roadside Geology of Idaho, which when we put this together, it was it was tricky to kind of divide the state up this way, but this seemed like a pretty reasonable way to do it. So we've got northern Idaho, which um, is actually a long ways from where I'm, where I'm at here in Twin Falls. It's a good it's a good nine ten hours just to get up into the northern part of the state. Um, so it's a, it's a it's a pretty heavy drive if you take it. And this area is mainly uh, comprised of Cretaceous granites, a lot of Precambrian sedimentary rocks, what are known as the Belt Supergroup, if you're familiar with those. The, the western margin over here is dominated by uh, two major rock types. We have the Columbia River basalts. We have these lava flows that extend into western Idaho from eastern Oregon and Washington, part of the big uh, flood basalts that cover the Columbia Plateau. And then we also have some accreted rocks, some uh, rocks that are much older than those that were actually slammed onto the edge of North America in the late Mesozoic and, or excuse me, late Paleozoic and early Mesozoic uh, time periods. And so there's some interesting rocks here that you don't find in any other part of the state. Then dominating the central part of the state is this, this huge area of mountains in a very really rugged type of terrain that's mostly dominated by granites that are Cretaceous in age. Some of them are Eocene, a little bit younger, uh, and just these big mountains. This is where our, our most mountainous uh, terrains are, is in the central part of the state. Uh, then we have the Snake River Plain, which is stretches from the southwest corner over to eastern Idaho and connects in with Yellowstone. And we'll talk more about that here in a few minutes. This is, this is where the, the farms are. This is this kind of flat, mostly flat, or low low topographic relief region that's dominated by these young volcanoes that we're going to focus on tonight. There's also uh, some expansive lake sediments. We had a large freshwater lake sitting over the western Snake River Plain uh, in, the, in the Pliocene about three to ten million years ago. And the Snake River Plain more or less bisects 
two uh, regions that are actually related, and that's the basin and range uh, province, this area of kind of alternating mountains and valleys that mostly trend to the north or the northwest. Um, and we've got good evidence that this was actually uh, one contiguous province or region uh, until the Yellowstone hotspot and some of the volcanic activity literally um, bisected it and kind of tore it into two pieces. And so that gives you a little brief overview, just sort of in a map as to how diverse uh, the state of Idaho is in terms of its geology. And just to give you something a little more enticing to look at, I thought I'd throw in a couple pictures here just so you can see how different the landscapes are. So uh, just a picture from, from northern Idaho with the the big lakes, the, the big forested hills here and, and low mountains. Uh, this is the western margin, the, the Hell's Canyon area where the salmon and snake rivers join together. The big lofty central mountains uh, punctuated. Maybe our most iconic mountain range is the, the Sawtooth Range, which is north of uh, Sun Valley and Ketchum near the town of Stanley. Our basin and range mountains, which actually are, are our highest mountains with Bora Peak, a little over 12,000 feet being our highest point. And then the Snake River Plain, which is dominated by these volcanic uh, vents and lava fields that we'll spend some time looking at. Um, okay, so let's start with the, the plate tectonic picture. And this is just sort of a snapshot view as to how this looks, but we've got, uh, Idaho obviously located right here in the top right corner of the diagram. Of course, the western margin of North America is a transform plate boundary up through uh, most of California that then becomes a subduction zone as we move into the Pacific Northwest. So we've got a plate colliding and, and shoving itself beneath North America in the Pacific Northwest. And that's what gives rise to our cascade volcanoes like Mount Shasta, Mount St. Helens, Mount Hood, Mount Rainier that runs through the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and then going south again, the San Andreas Fault System. And even though Idaho is not on a plate boundary, we are very much affected regionally by what's going on just to the west of us. And essentially, as, as the Pacific Plate is moving away to the northwest uh, so quickly, compared to the North American plate that actually kind of pulls on the edge of the North American plate, at least that's one model, and gives us the basin and range province. And so this part of Southern Idaho, <coughs> excuse me, is um, being extended more or less in, in an east-west direction. So even though we're not on a plate boundary, our earthquakes, our volcanic activity to some degree, and our mountains are largely, um, predicated by what's going on along that plate boundary to our west. So that gives you a little view as to what's going on kind of big picture wise. And we're going to focus tonight on what I think is a really spectacular part of southern Idaho. And that's the really outstanding volcanic features we find here in the Snake River Plain. So any good story about the, the Snake River Plains geology uh, begins with the story of the Yellowstone hotspot, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, but just to review and maybe familiarize some other folks with this, what we see when we look at southern Idaho, and in fact, a, a broader region around southern Idaho, is we see uh, a definitive and well-defined progression of ages. So in parentheses here next to all these volcanic fields is the age of this volcanic field when it was er explosively, or when it was erupting, excuse me, and this is an age in millions of years. And you can see a pretty nicely defined progression of ages getting younger. So as we move from the McDermott volcanic field in Northern Nevada to the Oahe field, to the Bruno Jarbage field, and on up to the Northeast, the ages of these volcanic fields get progressively younger until you finally end up at the current location of this, this volcano or this magma source, which is in Yellowstone National Park. Um, this is important for a lot of reasons. The, the passage of the Yellowstone hotspot, or excuse me, the passage of the Southern Idaho and the, the plate over the Yellowstone hotspot is absolutely what has not only dictated the geology, but also the topography. This is what's actually created this kind of low, somewhat smiley face across uh, Southern Idaho. It's really an anomalous region. We've got all these mountains around us, but where I live here in Twin Falls, the topography is largely fairly flat or low relief. And that's totally due to the Yellowstone hotspot and what it's done in this region. 
Um, and so we can look here at the ages of these volcanic fields uh, getting younger towards the northwest, excuse me, northeast towards the Yellowstone. And then if you kind of imagine projecting this into the future, if the North American plate continues to pass over this, what we think is a potentially a fixed hotspot, and if this hotspot continues to supply magma to the surface, you can imagine then that the, the current site of volcanic activity is going to shift from Yellowstone National Park, uh, exit Wyoming and head into central Montana, uh, and then it'll head across Montana. Now, it's, its current trajectory doesn't take it into Minnesota, but it definitely gets Minnesota a lot closer to uh, the Yellowstone hotspot than it is currently. So I guess if, if you love Yellowstone and you love the geology and the, the scenery there, I guess you find folks in Minnesota just need to wait, you know, a few tens of millions of years, and then it'll be a lot closer drive uh, for you to go visit that. Of course, by then it'll be in Canada, and that might be a little bit sticky if we export our nation's first national park to the Canadians. I don't know how well that would go, but uh, that's for someone else to figure out. But this nicely shows the progression of these volcanic fields to the northeast and forging of the Snake River Plain across across southern Idaho. Let's look at a different view of this. This is going to be sort of our focus for this evening. Um, this is what we're going to look at here is just sort of a generalized volcanic evolution of what the Yellowstone hotspot does as the plate moves across the top of it. Um, now, what's nice is that the Snake River Plain has exposed rocks from all these different phases or stages that we're looking at here. And so that allows us to piece together the full progression and evolution of volcanic um, activity that's caused by this hotspot. So keep these stages in mind as I start taking you on a better slideshow of some of the scenery and volcanic features here, because each place that I'm showcasing this evening is more or less directly related to at least one, if not more, of these stages of eruption or activity that's caused by uh, the Yellowstone hotspot. Um, <clears throat> so if we start here, um, before the eruption, what we would have then is the hotspot, the magma coming from deep within the earth, uh, and it is basaltic in composition. So it's the type of magma that you would see in Hawaii or Iceland. It's hot, it's fairly runny as far as magmas go. Um, but the problem is, is unlike those locations like Hawaii and Iceland, is this basaltic magma is rising through tens of miles of continental crust, of North American crust. And North American crust, like all continental crust, is dominantly granite in composition. And so what happens is this very hot magma, <clears throat> excuse me, starts to melt some of that continental crust. And as some of that continental crust melts, it changes some of the chemistry of the magma. And it creates a new batch of magma called rhyolitic magma. Now, this rhyolitic magma is a lot different than the basaltic magma. It's overall lower in temperature. It has more silica in it, which means uh, it has more like the mineral quartz in it. It also means that it's um, a lot stickier, pasty, more viscous. And the real the point here is this rhyolitic magma does not release gases very well. It traps the gases because it's so sticky and pasty. And then those gases can accumulate over time. So this rhyolitic magma, as it as it rises into the shallow portion of the crust here, it actually causes the crust to rise. So it's thermally uh, buoyed up by the heat of these magma chambers. Also notice the scale of, of this magma chamber. These are tens of miles across, much bigger than the types of magma chambers sitting underneath Mount St. Helens or your, or your typical like cone-shaped stratovolcano. So it's a, a much larger magmatic system. It also has, again, these trapped gases and that gas pressure just builds and builds and builds until you finally get some large scale eruption. And it usually takes, you know, a couple hundred thousand years or so. But ultimately, what can take place is um, we can get faults that provide um, pathways for the magma to escape. So these are going to become the vents. The two faults you see on either side of the magma chamber are actually going to be the location of the vents. So if we go to the next stage, which is a full blown, worst case scenario, uh, catastrophic large scale violent eruption of this system, we can see all the ash coming out. Um, of course, 
you know, this ash would be blown by the winds off to the east, which would be bad for you good folks in Minnesota and in the Plain States. Um, locally, it would be bad for uh, anyone that's nearby because it would not only produce uh, immense ash clouds and ash fall, but actually would also produce these pyroclastic flows, these big avalanches of very hot ash and debris that come racing down the flanks of this uplifted volcanic region at speeds of well over 100 miles an hour. Ultimately, if this eruption is big enough, and not all of them were, but some of them definitely were, and we have good evidence for that, these rhyolitic magma eruptions are so enormous that they partially deplete and empty the underlying magma chamber, causing wholesale collapse of the volcano downward. And if that's the case, then we have just produced what's known as a caldera or a volcanic caldera. Um, so not all the eruptions did this, but but several of them did as the North American plate drifted across the Yellowstone hotspot. So Southern Idaho's history is very much um, dictated to some degree by these immense eruptions and caldera collapses. So this is this is the the big Yellowstone internet scare nightmare that some folks would have you be believe uh, that would be taking place at this stage of its evolution. If we move forward though in time, um, we've had the big eruption. A lot of the gases have been completely uh, released during that large, violent and explosive eruption, but there's still rhyolitic magma down in our system. And that gas poor rhyolitic magma uh, may rise to the surface and ooze out as thick pasty, almost like toothpaste consistency lava and form uh, a type of volcano known as a lava dome or a volcanic dome. It might be within the crater, it might be slightly outside the crater, but we, we can see this definitively as well in different parts of the Snake River Plain uh, looking back. So we've got this caldera filled in with ash and, and fractured rock or what we call breccia. The flanks of the volcano are where the pyroclastic flows came down and I'll take you on a little tour of what those look like. And so this might be like, you know, the next step that some of these volcanic fields show in their evolution. And then finally, the last stage of our, our evolution is that rhyolitic magma is starting to cool and crystallize. And at some point, as it cools and crystallizes, uh, it's going to form granite or granitic-like rock. Uh, so it's starting to maybe solidify, although that would take some period of time. But there's still residual basalt below um, that now that the rock has crystallized partly, it's becoming, it's behaving more brittly. That basaltic magma can make an easier pathway to the surface and erupt and maybe form a low profile volcano like a shield volcano. And we'll show you some of these as well. So what I really want you to get out of this last diagram is the fact that even though when we look at Southern Idaho today, what we're kind of overwhelmed by and what we see mostly because it's on the surface are the basaltic lavas, the black lava fields <clears throat> like Craters of the Moon and other places in Southern Idaho. But what you're kind of missing or what, what's being concealed from view is that that basaltic lava is more or less a, a, a thin veneer, a chocolate frosting, if you will, on a much thicker uh, pile of, of other material, of rhyolites and, and other rocks. So hopefully this little progression helps a little bit. I'll kind of remind you of these as, as we work through them. Um, but this is this is the idea. This is the progression, or at least the kind of generalized cartoon version of what we would see happening in uh, the Snake River Plain. And this is also what we see happening to a large degree with the last few million or two years at Yellowstone National Park. We see three of these big eruptions like we see here in, in diagram B. We see rhyolite oozing out onto the caldera floors. There's younger uh, rocks around Yellowstone Lake and Old Faithful that show us that. And there's also portions in Yellowstone and just outside Yellowstone in eastern Idaho where it's gone to this stage here and started to produce uh, basaltic eruptions covering up some of the rhyolite eruptions that preceded it. So so this is our goal for tonight. Um, we're going to take you on a little, a little tour here of the Snake River Plain, which is this big swath extending from your lower left part of your screen up towards the upper right. Uh, down in the right corner, you can see all the alternating mountains and valleys in southeastern Idaho, down here near like Lava Hot Springs and Soda Springs. That's again, all part of the Basin and Range province. 
If we look across the Snake River Plain to the north at the top of your diagram or map here, we can see a lot of the mountains and can't quite see the basin and range extensions as well because I kind of cut the map off there, but you can start to see these northwest trends uh, coming across the basin and range. Uh, or, yeah, the, the southern part of the basin and range. And so you almost can line up some of these mountain ranges from north to south across the Snake River Plain. And there's some evidence that suggests that those, those structures did at one time exist across the Snake River Plain. But the Snake River Plain is this big swath of mostly flat to low relief topography uh, dominated by these big lava fields. And we'll go visit a couple of these. You can see the large uh, towns and agricultural communities in green uh, kind of interspersed amongst those lava fields. And then the stars are some of the places that <clears throat> I'm going to take you on on our tour this evening. So some places maybe that you've heard of, but also maybe some places less well known that maybe you could add to your, your, your southern Idaho itinerary if you're ever out this way or traveling through some places you might want to check out. So we'll look at Salmon Falls Creek Reservoir, uh, the area at Shoshone Falls, which is right along the Snake River, Black Magic Canyon, Craters of the Moon, which is a national monument, Kings Bowl, which is actually part of the expanded Craters of the Moon monument, Big Southern Butte, which is a, a very uh, visible landmark in uh, the Snake River Plain, and then the Manan Buttes just outside of Rigby and Rexburg in eastern Idaho. <clears throat> so let's get to some nice pictures and slides and scenery and also geology, and, and we'll kind of work our way through that through this next half of our, our presentation tonight. So, so we're going to start with our, <clears throat> our earliest phase of eruptive activity, and that's the eruption of rhyolite. So remember my diagram here, again, shown here in the bottom right corner to kind of remind you. So what, what areas of southern Idaho can you see some of these phases of rhyolite erupting from the ground when that section of Idaho was right over the Yellowstone hotspot. And I live here in Twin Falls, which is only a couple miles from uh, the iconic Shoshone Falls. And if you can if you can be here during the right year, so if it's a good spring or early summer, you get this kind of visual here in the bottom left photo, which is uh, just magnificent. It, it, it's taller than Niagara Falls. Uh, it has less water than Niagara Falls, but it's it's I would argue equally as spectacular when it's when it's doing its thing. Uh, unfortunately, if you come at the wrong time of year or maybe a dry year, uh, if you were out there right now, uh, actually, I was down there a couple of weeks ago uh, and it wasn't quite this bad, but some winters it can look a little bleak uh, where you just get a little trickle of water, maybe some frozen water over here where it's a little bit shaded. Uh, but the lack of water also means you get to see more rock. But all this light gray rock you're seeing that forms <clears throat> the main edifice of Shoshone Falls, this is all rhyolite. This is all six to eight million year old rhyolite that formed when this section of Idaho was sitting right on top of the Yellowstone hotspot. And we were the um, the active volcanic region at that time. Uh, and the photo on the left, the, the other rocks you might see up on the skyline, those are the basalts. That's the chocolate frosting. That's the much younger volcanic lavas that have filled in and poured over the top of these much larger volume uh, rhyolite lavas that sit below them. So this is a great place to visit, highly recommended. Um, some other just nice snapshots of, of what this rhyolitic volcanism can look like, both up close and at a distance. So we can see, you can see layers of ash in various places around the Snake River Plain, uh, this kind of light white, white to light gray ash. This would represent ash fall, so ash sort of settling uh, vertically out of the atmosphere, <clears throat> excuse me, during one of these large eruptions. Uh, there's also an interesting rock here uh, that might be a new one to you, even if you're even if you're a seasoned geologist, this might be a new one for you. There's a rock called vitrophere. And, <clears throat> and so vitrophere is interesting. It has crystals in it. So you can see these light colored crystals of um, feldspar, mainly potassium feldspar. Um, you can see that they're kind of rectangular in shape. Some of them are squarish. And the black material here probably doesn't come through in this photo, <clears throat> excuse me, but the black material here in the sunlight looks a lot like obsidian. And that's exactly what vitrophere is. It's an intermediate rock type between obsidian <clears throat> and rhyolite. So obsidian is silica rich lava that cools so quickly that there's no nucleation of crystals, no, no minerals actually form. The, the atoms, or excuse me, the elements themselves don't 
bond and join to form individual mineral crystals. That's one end of felsic lava behavior. At the other end, if there's plenty of crystallization going on during an eruption, then you would get rhyolite. Well, vitrophere is just an intermediate form between those two. So if there was some crystallization and some minerals forming, as you can see with the little kind of light white or pinkish specks here, but the rest of the material was quenched quickly and became glassy, then you would end up with, with a rock called vitrophere. So kind of a neat rock and one that I wasn't as familiar with until I moved here. So that, that might be a new one for you. Uh, this is just a scenic shot of teepee rocks. This is uh, maybe an hour from Twin Falls. This is all ash deposits. These are all from, I'm not sure if these are Bruno Jarbage ashes or from the Twin Falls uh, volcanic field. To my knowledge, they've not been dated. So there's not a definitive source and there's not been any geochemistry done on them either. So, but just a couple snapshots of rhyolitic volcanism in this area. Uh, one area that I've just become really, interested in and one of the stars I showed on our our map or overview map there of, of southern Idaho is this area around Salmon Falls Creek Reservoir and you see this in lots of other places but this is maybe one of the locations where it's uh, at it's sort of like uh, world class in terms of like just exposures um, and so what we have here is what's called a rheomorphic ignimbrite which is a big fancy term so let me break it down for you if this is if this is new an ignimbrite is a deposit, so it's not actually a rock type, it's a deposit uh, produced by a pyroclastic flow. So if we go down here to the bottom right and look at our diagram of the big violent uh, rhyolitic caldera collapse eruptions from these hotspot eruptions, we get these pyroclastic flows that come barreling down the flanks of the volcano, the ash cloud, uh, can eventually start to subside and sink, and that actually causes it to heat up and accelerate as it comes down these slopes. And these big terrifying avalanches of hot ash, gas, and debris um, <clears throat> actually can become so hot that they actually remelt and become somewhat molten in their behavior. And so an ignimbrite is just the deposit of a pyroclastic flow. It might include ash or tuff. It could include our new rock vitrophere. And it could include just good old rhyolite. Um, rheomorphic means that the, the rock actually is deforming as it's sort of in a molten or melted state. So what you can see here in both the photos is you can see a very bright pink or reddish uh, paleosol. So basically, this was the soil uh, before this big eruption. And then as this eruption comes down the landscape, so as this pyroclastic flow comes barreling across the landscape, the heat, the, the intense heat of this eruption actually bakes the underlying soils, oxidizes the iron that's present there, and turns it into this brick red color. At the same time, this thing is barreling across the landscape. Uh, this ash at the bottom is starting to accumulate, and it actually melt. So it's not white powdery ash like we would typically think of, but it actually becomes molten. Uh, and as it cools later on, it actually solidifies into rock. At the same time, and I'll show you a better diagram that, that explains the progression here in a second. At the same time, the ash is so turbulent that it's sort of, it's it's basically solidified enough that it's it's solid or semi-solid, but it's actually folding over the top of itself. So you can see these beautiful um, I guess recumbent folds, these sideways folds, and there's intricate folds all in here um, in this ignimbrite deposit, in these pyroclastic flow deposits that came barreling out of these volcanoes in, in the past. So I wanted to put this together here. If we start at the top here, here's our pyroclastic flow moving from left to right across the landscape, but the Pyroclastic material, the ash at the bottom is actually, there's so much of it and it's so hot, it's actually starting to weld itself together into, again, a, a kind of a semi solid viscous match. So it's really mass, it's really behaving more like lava than ash at this point. But this material starts to aggrade, it actually starts to accumulate and, and thicken as more ash pours over the top of it. So the ash at the top is turbulent, it, it's, it's rolling, it's moving in all sorts of chaotic ways. Um, but then the, the more semi-solid material down below is starting to deform. And that's where we get these folds starting to form here. The bottom of this is probably chilled quite quickly against the 
underlying ground. So that's my that's where we a lot of times see the vitrophere forming. Uh, and then once this whole mass of ash comes to rest, then we would see it all turned into rhyolite, just uh, straight up rhyolite uh, in terms of rock type. But it still preserves within its structure these intricate and rheomorphic folds, just these almost like sheath folds, just totally bent on itself. And so um, this is just, I'm, I'm not doing heavy research on this, but I'm definitely getting more uh, interested in this story. And I've, I've read some of the papers that, uh, of some people that have looked at this and it's just absolutely amazing. So put this on your bucket list for sure. Um, and hopefully I did a good job explaining that. There's also a video where I, I take you to this location and and explain it maybe a little better there. Um, let's look at another big feature. So amongst all the volcanoes in the Snake River Plain, um, the one that is the tallest, the one that actually sticks up the highest and forms the biggest uh, volcanic edifice at over 2,000 feet tall is what's called Big Southern Butte. And this sits sort of in the eastern part of the Snake River Plain. So it's this massive steep-sided volcano. It looks very different from a lot of the volcanoes around here, which are more gentle in terms of their slopes, uh, not nearly as tall. And what this actually is, is this is a extrusion of rhyolitic lava. So again, going back to our diagram here um, that I'm showing on the, the right here, uh, this would represent a, a, a late stage eruption of rhyolite after the explosive phase has come and gone. And so you can see this thing, this thick pasty lava just kind of oozing and welling up and piling on itself to make this steep sided dome uh, that you see here. You can see in the bottom left photo, uh, the color of the rhyolite, so not to confuse it from with the basalt, but it's actually this kind of white, uh, sugary looking rock. And as you head up onto uh, Big Southern Butte, you actually see quite a diversity of rocks. There's some obsidian up there as well. And the obsidian is kind of interesting because it was actually, this location was um, a known uh, place where Native Americans actually quarried or harvested some of the obsidian and traded it with other indigenous groups and we can actually trace that obsidian and its sort of path through the trade market across different portions of the western U.S. Um, here's some of the diversity of rocks. It does show us that at some point Big Southern Butte was somewhat explosive because there is places where you get a little bit of pumice, a little bit of fragmented rock types, stuff that's being thrown out of the vent, not just oozing out lava, although that's mainly what it did. And then on the north side of Big Southern Butte, if you look at this larger photo at the top here, you'll see some dark colored beds of basaltic lava that are tilted to your left, which is to the north. <clears throat> and this is some of the basalt that existed there previously that was uplifted and rotated as the rhyolite pushed upwards. And so the cartoon here nicely shows uh, the basalts were there first. Uh, this rhyolite came up through this. I believe the age of Big Southern Butte is about 300,000 years. Um, so as this rhyolite pushed upwards, it actually domed the basalt above it. Ultimately, the rhyolitic lava broke through. Uh, some of the basalt slabs sank into it because they were more dense. But in other places where they were still attached to the surrounding lava flows, they actually formed sort of a tilted layer like we see here uh, on the north side. So that's the, our, our, our stage of rhyolitic volcanic activity. Uh, then of course, our last stage we looked at was the eruption of basaltic lavas, which is the dominant theme throughout much of Southern Idaho and the Snake River Plain. So this would be more like your Hawaiian or Iceland lavas, like you see in the lower right photo there, more or less <clears throat> runny lavas oozing down the slopes. This would be the tourist, uh, type of eruption, right? So if, if if and when, maybe not if, but when uh, Southern Idaho gets another eruption like this, this is when you definitely want to come out and enjoy it because it's it's going to be something you can view uh, from a fairly close distance safely and just enjoy the spectacle. This is a picture of basalt up close with all its gas bubbles or vesicles, some green crystals of olivine, which it sometimes has as well. And then the top photo here is a typical shield volcano. Around here, there are mostly all called buttes. So this is one called Notch Butte. A lot of them have uh, radio and other communication towers on top uh, because they, they form the high points in the Snake River Plain. And we've had basaltic volcanism going on in the Snake River Plain, depending on what part you're in, from about 5 million years 
up until very, very recently, or, or essentially the present. And we do expect future eruptions as well. And so you can see a lot of the vents uh, on this uh, digital elevation model, kind of looking across the Snake River Plain, all these uh, little bumps, all these pimples or uh, little dots you can see throughout the Snake River Plain are all, for the most part, shield volcanoes or more fundamentally volcanic vents. Here's Big Southern Butte, which we just looked at, the big rhyolite dome. There's actually two more related to it, East Butte and Middle Butte, which are fundamentally the same uh, types of features, but not as big as Big Southern Butte. But the main thing we're looking at here are all these little dots and high, subtle high features here throughout the Snake River Plain. These are all these uh, basaltic volcanic vents. Uh, and of course, the, the pre premier location to really explore and appreciate basaltic volcanism in southern Idaho is Craters of the Moon um, Lava Field. And this is the largest lava field in the lower 48 states. Um, it's uh, at its youngest, it's only about 2000 years old. So it's exceptionally young lava. Um, this part down here is also part of the Craters of the Moon Monument. And then you might be able to pick out a couple of the other ones we have as well. There's this one over here, just north of where I live, that's about 11,000 years old. This is the Shoshone Lava Flow. Uh, there's one over here by Big Southern Butte that's called, um, oh, this is the Robbers, uh, Cerro Grande Robbers Lava Field, if I remember correctly. This is the Wapai Lava Field. And then this other area here out towards Idaho Falls is called Hell's Half Acre and the freeway Interstate 15 goes right over the top of a portion of that. So let's take a look at some of the, the exceptional volcanic landscapes around Craters of the Moon. So this is what it looks like if you, if you head out in the summertime. And because we have this dry, arid climate here in Southern Idaho, the, the volcanic features look like they may be erupted very recently. There's very little vegetation, soil development on top of these basaltic lava fields. So here's two small little spatter cones. Uh, these things are only uh, maybe a few tens of feet high forming along uh, a central rift. And I'll show you an aerial view of that. But you can see the basaltic lava flows here ranging from kind of smooth, what we call pahoehoe lavas in the foreground, and then the more kind of rubbly uh -uh lava flows here in the middle ground. Um, I wanted my good friends in Minnesota to know that um, our topography might look like yours in the winter. So if you come out to craters in the wintertime, you might feel right at home with your Minnesota winters, because I was actually out there about two or three weeks ago doing some cross country skiing. And, and this is that's those same uh, spatter cones I just showed you in the in the last picture. Uh, but here it is all blanketed under a foot and a half or so of nice snow. So it's it, it's actually a really beautiful landscape in the winter. There's uh, the loop road is closed, but they groom it for cross country skiing and snowshoeing. So it's just a really magical place to check out in the wintertime. Um, Here's an aerial view. We're looking at those same two spatter cones, which you can drive right up to here. This is more like in the springtime when the snow is starting to melt and recede. But what we're seeing here is we're actually looking along the axis of what's called the Great Rift. You can actually look way out there in the distance and see a volcanic vent or crater. Another one here a little closer, kind of two here on either side. And then more of these uh, cinder cones, spatter cones, and shield volcanoes that define this portion of uh, Craters of the Moon. What we think is going on here is we think the basin and range extension, because the way these line up is more or less northwest, southeast, or, or almost north-south, but it's pretty much parallel to the faults that we see in much of the basin and range. So we think that there's an added tectonic control that's causing uh, enhanced volcanic activity and the most recent volcanic activity uh, in this region. And so it's not just the story of the hotspot here. We think also that the basin and range extension is thinning the crust, allowing more magma to be uh, generated than would be otherwise, and then providing pathways through the fracturing of the rock above it, excuse me, for this magma to erupt. So um, we talked about Yellowstone and we're looking at Craters of the Moon now. And if you're a betting man or person, um, I would place my money on the craters in the moon region erupting way before anything happens in Yellowstone. It's a system that's had, uh, let's see, in the last 15,000 years, it's had eight major eruptions. I think I got that right. 
uh, or eight eruptions of lava. And it's the type of magmatic system that erupts much more frequently. So we'd expect, just like Hawaii and Iceland, this type of system to erupt more easily because the gases can escape, the lava can rise much more easily versus like in Yellowstone where those gases are trapped in that sticky magma and it takes a long time between big eruptions to generate the next one. Uh, you can see some other cool features uh, at Craters of the Moon. These are called lava trees in the top or the top photo here. And then the bottom photo shows a tree mold. So when Craters of the Moon was erupting the last few times, there were trees in the area. Those trees uh, were surrounded by lava that was erupted. The tree was incinerated. It burned. But because the lava chills, up against the bark of the tree quite quickly, it actually preserves in the lava itself the impression and the pattern of the bark, which allows botanists to at least uh, determine maybe not the species, but at least the genus of the tree. Uh, and also a lot of times this will preserve charcoal. So some of that burnt wood might be preserved, might be in a little hollow pocket somewhere in there. And that charcoal becomes useful because it can be dated using carbon-14, and we can actually date the eruption by the age of the charcoal. Uh, these lava trees here are just places where the lava sort of piles up against the base of the tree. So in this case, the lava flow is moving from your left to your right. That lava piles up against the base of the tree, cools quickly. Again, the tree gets burned completely, but it leaves these hollow uh, cylindrical tubes showing where the lava tree trunk uh, once was. And so these these little uplifted areas with these holes in them are what we call these lava trees. And then the interior, which sometimes preserves the, the bark, is what we call tree mold. So really kind of cool. I mean, it's there's so much diversity there. Uh, saying it's just lava and it's all the same stuff, I think is completely missing some of the, the cool intricacies and subtle features that are there. At the southern end of... Um, Craters of the Moon, we have an area called King's Bowl. So this is an eruptive fissure. So rather than the lava coming out of one centralized vent, the lava was actually erupted from more or less a crack in the ground running across the, the landscape here. Most of the eruption was fairly benign with just lava kind of oozing out and pouring across the landscape. So you can see this large lava field on either side of the fissure or the crack there, similar to what we just had take place in Hawaii, if you were watching some of the news in December of this year, this past year, uh, on Mauna Loa. Mauna Loa finally became active again after more or less sleeping since 1984. And the style of eruption uh, there was a, a fissure eruption, similar to what we had here at Kings Bowl about 2,000 years ago. But one of the coolest features here, and the reason maybe to add this to your your vacation list is if you head down to this open area here. So if you look at the central portion of the fissure, you'll see there's kind of this teardrop or eye shape that's much wider than the rest of the, the fissure. And this is, a, this is the Kings Bowl area itself. And this is a location where the eruption became a little bit more explosive. So the water, or excuse me, the lava interacted with the groundwater beneath it and started to become explosive. So what we had happening at the beginning, if you look at the top diagram here, is we had the lava just kind of oozing out and we essentially had a lava lake forming on either side of the fissure as this lava kind of passively oozed out of the ground. And the lava probably walled off and kept that water from mixing with it for, some, for, for a time being, at least initially. But at some point, the water actually mixed with the lava and when water mixes with lava that allows the water to turn to steam which is an expansion process it takes up more volume and so it becomes explosive and so it excavated a larger kind of pit around the the fissure it threw out chunks of rock uh, onto the surrounding landscape and then the coolest thing at least i think this is really quite uh, remarkable is that some of these blocks that went flying through the air actually hit the lava lake, which had partially crusted over, some of those rocks penetrated into the underlying lava, which was still molten. And then the lava actually pushed upwards through that crack to form these kind of mushroom or um, like a Hershey's kiss shape, uh, toadstool shaped little things called squeeze ups. And so here in the lower left, you can see one of these blocks that just hit part of the lava lake 
uh, that had pretty much cooled and solidified and it just made like a little crater and you can see the different colored rock. But then on the right here, you can see places where the lava lake was penetrated by these flying blocks and then oozed out of the ground to form these these just I mean they're just really cool they look kind of like cow pies but they're taller right they're they're not flat all the way they actually are um conical you know with a, a peak at the top here and they're maybe I don't know like a, a foot to foot and a half tall you can see the rock hammer there for scale uh but these are these things called squeeze ups and I've never seen anything like them but it's it's such a cool little story uh with it's, it's such a cool little uh volcanic landform that I thought that would I thought maybe that would be of interest to some folks so um so as we kind of wrap up here with our last few locations, let's explore in a little bit more detail the role that water has played with lava. Because if you think about it, where's the lava going when it erupts? Downhill. What's at the most downhill location in any landscape? Usually water, could be a lake, could be a river. And so my point is, is that lava from these volcanic eruptions, basaltic eruptions in the Snake River Plain and water have been fighting over the same real estate for at least the last few million years. And in some cases, like at Kings Bowl, um, the results have been interesting and at least you know, somewhat explosive. So here's another location in Eastern Idaho. And this is, um, just to orient you here, we're looking to the Northeast. Uh, the South Fork is the South Fork of the Snake River. So this is the Snake River fork that comes through the Tetons and Jackson Hole and then comes into Idaho. And then over here, just to the left of it on our, our photo here, is the Henry's Fork of the Snake River. So this is the, the fork of the Snake River that's coming out of West Yellowstone area, Island Park, and then flowing down. And then you can see these two forks of the Snake River joining <clears throat> more or less over here and then flowing uh, off and across uh, southern Idaho to, to the west. Um, but if you look at their pass, you can see that they completely take a detour around these two uh, very visible and noticeable volcanic vents, these two craters here. These are the Manan Buttes. Um, and these volcanoes erupted right in the middle of these two river systems. So if you actually take these volcanoes out, you might be able to come up with a a map or a confluence point rather than being over here. These two rivers probably met maybe somewhere in here, um, but their eruptions have um, most definitely diverted the Snake River and dictated its, its current path around these two cones. We don't have a good firm date on these because the material is not ideal for dating, but definitely older than 10,000 years and maybe as old as like 90 to 80,000 years. I think those are the numbers bouncing around my head. So here's these buttes from ground level. You can see some people walking up the trail here. There's a, a nice trail on North Manan Butte uh, that takes you all the way up to the rim. But you can see the shape here, very similar to what we see with shield volcanoes, but maybe a little bit steeper and taller. And then most noticeably, unlike shield volcanoes, these are not made out of lava flows. When you get up and look at these closely, these volcanoes are made out of these pyroclastic deposits or ash or tuff. Um, you can see them dipping away from the crater or the, the summit area of the volcano. In places, if you look at the bottom right photo here, you can see that there's big blocks of embedded basalt in with the tuff. Uh, and so this thing was definitely explosive. It was definitely throwing out chunks of rock while it was erupting. And most interesting to me is that while it was erupting this material, it was actually also throwing out river cobbles. So here's a nice rounded um, little gravel or cobble of quartzite, which belongs down in the riverbed. So this volcano was apparently interacting with not just the river system, but potentially also the shallow groundwater just below the river. And it was excavating and throwing out chunks of river rocks, as well as the volcanic material uh, when it was erupting, which is pretty cool. So North Manan Butte, uh, which I think is a national historic landmark or something like that is should definitely be on your list. And then my my last one here looks like my time's just about up, but my last um, location I want to take you to is a place just north of Twin Falls um, that's really quite remarkable. And so the story here is we have a young shield volcano erupting 
about 11,000 years ago. This is Black Butte Crater. And the lava field here is called the Shoshone Lava Flow. Uh, and you can see that here on this bottom diagram or map here. But let's start at this top map here. So before this thing erupted, so before the eruption of this shield volcano, we had two river systems joining together. The Bigwood River, which comes out of Sun Valley, Ketchum, the central mountains of Idaho, and the Littlewood River, which drains an area uh, from the mountains just to the east of there. And those two probably joined together to form the Malad River somewhere about here. And I know there's not a lot of other context here, but somewhere in here, they probably joined. But then Black Butte erupted about 10, 11,000 years ago. The lava went down, basically buried the existing stream. So it completely disrupted and um, just completely obliterated whatever river system was already established. And by the time the river found a new path around the Shoshone lava flow, notice that the Big Wood River stays on one side of the lava flow. The Little Wood River stays on the other side. And now these two rivers don't join until a lot further downstream um, towards the town of, uh, of Gooding. What this did, though, was that it diverted the Big Wood River to a new location. And the Big Wood River over the last 10, 11,000 years has been cutting down a new channel um, into the underlying older basalts. And what it has provided for us is this really just magical little labyrinth. It's essentially a slot canyon. You can see how narrow this gets in places. Um, you can see how beautifully sculpted the rock is. So this is what the river bed looks like because there's a portion of the year where you can walk through this, where they divert the water out of the river um, and you can actually hike through this just incredible landscape and look at these just fluted and just wonderfully shaped. This is all basalt. This is all hard volcanic rock. But these gravels you see here on the bed are actually even harder. And as they swirl around in eddies and different vortices and whirlpools, uh, it actually sculpts the rock. So here's one of these potholes you can see here with these hard rounded river rocks at the bottom. These are sometimes called grinders. So you can imagine a, a swirling river or water pattern in here, basically moving and swirling these rocks around just like just like a drill bit on a drill rig uh, and, and cutting these beautiful cylindrical potholes. Uh, this is my daughter and her friend uh, a couple of years ago, just to show you how deep some of these, these potholes can be. Um, and here's a diagram that kind of explains it. So you have these big floods that would have occurred you know, during the last ice ages, the glaciers were melting, uh, moving all the sediment. The big rocks on the bottom were just be kind of swirled and moved around, uh, progressively creating these potholes. Once the gravels get trapped in the bottom of these potholes, it's hard for them to get out of there. And so they just keep cutting down and down and they keep making themselves wider and deeper until finally these potholes end up kind of merging together to form some of these uh, spectacular features there. So Black Magic Canyon is, is the name of this. It's a little bit off the, the beaten path, but I've got it uh, featured in that first book I put together. I, I provide some directions on how to get to it. Um, just a really magical place to go explore uh, during certain parts of the year. So uh, I believe that's it. I just want to thank everyone for, for joining me today, um, this evening. And I hope you learned a few new things about Idaho and its geology. I hope maybe uh, there was a little eye candy and enticement to potentially uh, travel here on vacation or come visit and check out the magnificent geologic wonders here in southern Idaho. And so with that, uh, I will relinquish control and stop sharing and turn things back over to our moderators. Well, thank you. That was, that was a wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed that. Um, and uh, so we do have some questions. Great. And uh, I'm going to start with uh, some of my questions first. Uh, sure. First of all, comment. Um, we in Minnesota are very familiar with potholes because uh, we have uh, some world-class ones uh, not very far from the Twin Cities. So, uh, oh, great! People, I was not aware of that. So, thank you. That's yeah. yeah. What, what's yeah, the source of the Twin Cities area? You know, it's called Taylor's Falls. It's called uh, right on the Saint Croix River. Um, uh, and another unrelated question, though, is you had a picture of Iceland there that you took last year. When were you there? So this would be August. Um, of 2022 so it just 
it was the perfect uh, sequence of events where um, the semester hadn't started yet, so I didn't have to be on campus. My wife was already working, so she, she didn't need me. And so it was a two week little window where uh, the volcano started erupting. I bought the ticket that day and um, I flew there within a week, got to witness the eruption over a couple of days, flew home and a couple of weeks later, the, the, the eruption ended. And so I was really lucky to be there uh, when this volcano was erupting, it was spectacular. Uh, I was actually there at that time too, um, oh. on a geology field trip, um, ILSG which stands for the Institute on Lake Superior Geology. Um, and uh, I, I personally did not see the eruption, but uh, some of the people in the group were able to. And, and then they, due to weather, they closed it just, uh, just as uh, they, they, those few people saw it. Yeah, uh, you must have been there right after me, because I, I, I remember when that happened. I think it was a, a week or so after I got there. The weather got really nasty, and, the, and it was... Oh, it was, it was, it was uh, Iceland where it lived up to its name. When, <laughs> <laughs> well, too bad you missed it. That, yeah, it was... Yeah, well, I, I did see photos, obviously, from some of the people that did see it. Right. Uh, okay, after that aside, I'm going to ask one question that's uh, pertinent to your presentation. Um, you mentioned the uh, at the Black Magic Canyon, the river's diverted. Why is it diverted? Um, so the lava goes right into the river channel. So the, the lava flows completely take over whatever canyon or arroyo or gully the river has established. The lava fills that in completely. And now the river is forced to find a new path. And usually what happens is the river ends up taking a new path on the edges of the, the flow. So if you kind of well, I am not screen sharing anymore, but if you if you were to look at a map, the rivers now flow along the margin of that young lava flow there. OK, yeah, I understand that. Actually, my question was different. Um, oh, sorry. It, it sounded like the rivers diverted. That's why you were able to hike in the canyon. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. So it's um, <laughs> it's kind of weird that there's a canal company that has um, rights to the river. So during the spring, late spring and summer, they divert a lot of the Bigwood River water into the canal system. Um, and so that lets you get in there at that period of time. Also in the winter, they, a lot of times, the Bigwood River flows into a reservoir and they hold all that water back so they can have more water for irrigation season. And so that's a good time as well. Like this time of year right now is a good time to go through there. So what's magical about it is you're literally walking through a riverbed, but the water's gone. Like the water's been taken out of the equation. Uh, and so all you need to do is there's a canal company, you can just call the number and make sure they're not releasing the water that day, because that would obviously be a bad situation. But for the most part, it um, it's dry for a good portion of the year and you can hike right through it. Cool. Okay, I'm gonna go to uh, questions that people have typed in. Uh, first question from Joe. Uh, rhyolite in Northern Minnesota is red in color. Why the difference in color compared to Idaho? Um, we have red. Our rhyolites are, are reddish too. My guess without knowing much about Minnesota rhyolite is that yours is a lot older. And even though rhyolite is not an iron rich rock, it still has iron in it. So my guess would be that the iron in it has more opportunity to oxidize. Um, we have, I don't think we have red rhyolites, but they're, they can be a little bit pinkish. They tend to be more gray when they're fresh. Um, and ours are just a lot younger. And so I think I, my guess would be it's dominantly an iron oxidation issue and age. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, and a question from Mike, what spatial trends are there in subsurface heat flow in the Snake River Plain? What? Say that again. I got to digest all that. Yeah, it is a. What spatial trends are there in the subsurface heat flow in the Snake River Plain? Okay, spatial trends and subsurface heat flow. Um, full answer: I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know if like, I think I think he's he's alluding to geophysics. Um, I'm not, I just, I'm not as familiar with that. So I, I'll, I'll uh, proclaim ignorance on that one. Um, I think broadly you can see the rocks still in, in the Snake River Plain, the rocks at depth are still hot. So even though the hot spot passed through here, at least in where I live here in central, South Central Idaho, eight to 10 million years ago, we still have hot springs 
Uh, my campus is um, runs on geothermal water, so our, it's heated by geothermal water. Downtown Boise is heated at least partially by geothermal energy, so the heat source is still there. I don't know what trends you would see spatially, though, if you were to look at that, if it would just be the whole Snake River Plain, or would you see like linear trends following like um, some of these basin and rain structures, which is maybe what he's talking about. So not sure. Really good question, though. Okay. If, if you have any follow up to that, Mike, you can type it in or we can uh, we can unmute you. But we'll go on to other questions. Uh, here's a, a basic one from Pete. What is tough? Oh, good question. So tough is just volcanic ash that has been welded and consolidated into rock. So ash is when it's still loose and disaggregated or, or unconsolidated. But once it becomes uh, consolidated into rock, even if it's a little crumbly, uh, we call it tough. So ash is the particle size from a volcano and tough is the rock equivalent of that. OK, thank you. Yep. Um, from John, just uh, this is not a question, but this is a truly excellent presentation. Many thanks. It certainly helped fill in a lot of information I wish I had when I was at Craters of the Moon a few years ago, but now I understand so much better. Oh, great. Yeah, actually, I've been last few years, I've been working with their staff and just training them a little bit on the geology. So hopefully, if you return, uh, you'll have some knowledgeable folks there that can answer some of your questions. Yeah, I visited there about, I think, 2005. And uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I learned a lot today. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. Uh, here's from Norm. Uh, great presentation. Very approachable. No excessive technical jargon. Thanks so much. Uh, PS, yeah, and, oh, yeah. I see the rest of that. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay, You can read it. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up in Oakley, South of Burley. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Norm. Um, yeah. I think I think where geologists and scientists in general where we do a disservice to the public is talking above them with all our fancy words and terms, when in reality, you can explain the story and you can convey the information very easily by just taking out some of the crazy buzzwords, right? I threw in a couple there just for fun, reomorphic ignimbrites and vitrofear and you know stuff you can impress your friends with. But ultimately, all these cool stories are completely uh, we can completely present them in a manner that the public can consume them and understand them. Um, and that's what I've been really into and passionate about um, my whole career is through the books and the YouTube and everything else is just getting these stories to the people who are interested um, and not talking way over the top of them like I'm like it's a scientific journal. So yeah, thank you for that, Norm. Okay, um, I'll go on to uh, Dan. Excellent presentation, Sean. Is all the earthquake activity in Idaho fault-based, or are there any indication that magna may be moving at depth? Any yeah, good question. being monitored for deformation? Yeah, sorry, I didn't let you finish. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Dan's a, a great uh, fan and someone who follows me, so I appreciate that. Um, um, <laughs> how do I answer this? I would say most of the earthquake activity in Idaho, 90 plus percent of it uh, is definitively linked to fault movement, right? So it's tectonic in origin. That would include the Stanley earthquake in March 2020. We sometimes get swarms of earthquakes around this town called Chalice, Soda Springs. Um, you know, the Snake River Plain, as far as we can tell, there is no longer magma, a pool of magma sitting beneath the Snake River Plain in the crust. Now, there may be magma much deeper, but at shallow levels where we would expect magma to move and create earthquakes, there's no evidence for that. That would be the first big indicator that a potential eruption is about to take place. So I would love nothing more than in the next soon, basically, uh, to see earthquake swarms picking up maybe somewhere near craters of the moon. That would be potentially indicative of a new batch of magma rising towards the surface, breaking rock to create its own pathways and, and plumbing systems. And that would be maybe a precursor to eruption. But for the most part, Dan, I think I would assume that definitely outside the Snake River Plain, it's all fault-based. And even the few earthquakes we get in the Snake River Plain are probably fault-based as well, at least for now, but stay tuned. 
I'm going to add a little bit there. If sure. these eruptions were to occur, do you think they would be that they wouldn't be horribly destructive? Or I mean, I, yeah, I mean, you can't know for sure, but the the next eruption to happen in this region, uh, and this is my opinion, you can take it for what it's worth, will be a effusive eruption of basaltic lava. It will be a tourist attraction. It will be great for our local economy. It will be a spectacle that I hope lots of people can enjoy. It will not be an explosive ash cloud from Yellowstone. I mean, it's it's really the, the chances of your hundred years on this planet coinciding with the very few and far between Yellowstone big eruptions is like, it's such a small chance, right? And Yellowstone's not showing any signs of doing anything yeah the geysers are doing their thing and there's earthquakes here and there but yellowstone would show lots of signs of an impending eruption um but craters the moon we, as we've just seen it's erupted what i say eight times in the last fifteen thousand years during that period of time yellowstone hasn't done anything absolutely nothing in terms of erupting so these basaltic magma systems erupt much more frequently they erupt much more often um, than these rhyolitic systems. And we can see that in Hawaii. We can see that in Yellowstone. We can see it in the Galapagos and lots of places. And so I'm probably long-winded on my answer here, but um, hopefully that was a good follow-up there. Well, if it ever happens, you can get a, do another edition of your book. Yeah, there we go. When it all changes, right? <laughs> okay, next question uh, from Mary Helen. In the diagram of the crust movement over the Yellowstone hotspot, most of it is chronologically in a line, but the last three are not chronologically in order. What happened there? Oh, okay. Let me look at that while she while I'm thinking about that. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, what she's seeing there is that they're superimposed. So if you what she's talking about is the last three eruptions at Yellowstone, the two million year old or two point one million year old Island Park Caldera eruption was huge. It was the biggest of the three. And let's say it occupies this area. I'll just kind of show this with my camera maybe a little bit. Um, then the next one is was 1.3 million years ago. Well, it was still in the same caldera, but just a little part of it, a little corner of it, back to the east, or excuse me, the west a little bit. And then the most recent eruption about 600,000 years ago um, was still mostly in the island park caldera, although some of it was in a new area, and that was to the, 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 the east. Um, and really, if you were able to have that kind of detail with all these other volcanic fields, Mary Helen, if you looked at all these other older volcanic fields and we could see all the individual eruptions within those fields, we would see that they're not perfectly in a line chronologically, that maybe it pops off here and then it moves back to the west and then it moves here and then it. So the general progression is there from southwest to northeast, but in the individual details, it's bouncing around just a little bit within that region. So really good, good observation there and a good question. Okay, and then uh, Mike just said your answers from earlier were good enough for him. Okay, great. Um, and and then Rachel, what differences in flows result in rhyolite versus tuff? Oh, thank you, Rachel, and uh, thanks for your question. Um, what difference in flows? Like, I don't know if she's talking about pyroclastic flows. So let me answer this. I, I think I can answer this. Um, I think it's all the definition of the words. So rhyolite is a volcanic rock with a specific composition. It's rich in silica. It's going to have a lot of quartz in it. Um, so that's a rock type. It's a composition. It's also a composition of magma. We sometimes talk about rhyolitic magma. Tuff is, tuff, tuff has no composition. Tuff is, if a volcanic eruption is explosive and it throws out mostly ash-sized particles, then the rock that would form from that would be tuff. You can have basaltic tuff, and we saw basaltic tuff at um, Minan Buttes in my presentation. You can have andesitic tuff. You can have any volcanic rock type or magma type can make tuff if it's explosive. Um, so rhyolite is the rock type. Tuff is the, if it, if it breaks and fragments explosively into ash sized particles. So a lot of the tuffs that came out of Yellowstone or the Snake River Plain when we were above the Yellowstone hotspot were rhyolitic tuff. Um, and so the 
if she's talking about pyroclastic flows, that pyroclastic flow is mostly made out of ash particles, but chemically, the composition of that, that ash cloud, that pyroclastic flow, in this case, if we're talking about those types of eruptions, would be rhyolite. When it comes to rest, if it doesn't, if it's just a normal pyroclastic flow and it just condenses, then it would be tough. But in this case, like we talked about with um, some of these eruptions, these super volcanic Yellowstone eruptions, there's so much heat in that pyroclastic cloud that it remelts. And by the time it solidifies into rock, the rock type, it's lost all the granularity of being a tough. It's remelted itself to some degree. And so when it crystallizes, it looks more like a rhyolite. And so that's why we call it a rhyolite, even though at one point in time, it probably would have been a tough, but it, it was too hot to become a tough. I probably butchered that, Rachel. I apologize, but hopefully that, that was okay. Okay. I'm going to, if anybody else has questions, uh, now's the time. Um, we're going to be finishing up here. Um, and then I'll, I'll ask a comment from Nancy. Oh, this was just terrific. I've been to Priest Lake way up north, but would love to see more of Idaho now. And Nancy, I'm the opposite. I've seen lots of Southern Idaho and it's still keeping me enthralled, uh, but I'd like to get up north and see more of Priest Lake in Northern Idaho. Cause as you well know, it's a long drive from North to South and um, it, it takes a lot of time to get up there. So yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, John. Sean, this is Steve Erickson. Hi, that was a great talk. We really want to appreciate your your thoroughness and and the the mix of of good scientific stuff with keeping it a little bit lighter. That's a good good deal. And we also thank you for the tourism trick. Yeah, trick well, there. That's I, that's a good combination, and that's the kind of talk I've I've always wanted to get my speakers to give me. Oh, good. Um, I'm glad I hit the hit it right in the right spot. You sure did. Um, I'm curious now, and everybody's going to have to think about this a little bit, and I know and understand what you're saying, that I'm not going to lose any sleep tonight over over um, uh, Yellowstone. But right. if there was an eruption, I'm mm -hmm. looking at earthnullschool.net, which shows the jet stream patterns. It goes Tonight, it goes directly over Yellowstone or directly over Minneapolis. Right. So you'd be in trouble. <laughs> how much how much uh, debris and how far east would such a debris go? Uh, I'm curious, would it go all the way to the east coast or do they have any idea? I mean, they're guessing. I understand that. I can appreciate that it's it's an unknown. But right. what's the best guesses so far on that? No, great question, Steve. So we don't really have to guess because we have the last three eruptions, which produced ash that drifted across the eastern part of the country. That ash fell out of the sky. It's still in places preserved in the soil and in, in the subsurface. And so we can measure the thickness of that ash and actually make maps that show the extent of the ash fall uh, that at least accumulated on the ground. Um, it didn't get to the eastern seaboard, but it did get down to like Houston and the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so if Yellowstone were to erupt tonight, which it won't, so sleep well, my yep. Minnesota friends, <laughs> Um, that ash, as you said, based on the, the air patterns and the jet stream and such, would, would drift into Minnesota and, and uh, that area. But the ash would have cooled substantially at that point. So you, the, 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 the risk of you dying tonight or tomorrow from <laughs> ash you know, accumulations in Minnesota is minimal. Uh, it would probably be, depend on how big the eruption was and some of the jet stream variables but probably let's say even let's even put a foot of ash on minnesota now that would be bad economically um it potentially could topple some power lines or could be some infrastructure ramifications but in terms of like death deaths or fatalities like essentially no one should die in that um because it's just it's a significant distance it's not going to fall out of the sky still really hot um and the nice thing is we all live in a modern world where we can just come indoors. So if you look out your window and there's six inches of ash or, or snow or whatever's outside and you don't want to deal with it, then you can just stay inside. Um, it would be bad for the the uh, agricultural economy. It, don't get me wrong. It would have some serious effects. It would it would I don't want to say devastate, but it would seriously impact our nation's economy on some levels. And I'm I'm not bright enough to forecast that. 
but in terms of just danger to you know human health or something like that it would be minimal you don't want to breathe it in the air quality might be poor for a couple of days but you guys have wet weather you got winds and that should that should get it out of there pretty quickly within a few days or weeks i would guess so yeah. sure I, I appreciate that and i, I can understand that it's, it's not the I'm like I said, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it tonight, and I don't think anybody else should. But uh, we're just kind of curiosity as to how impactful the uh, Yellowstone. I've heard so many different stories about it. I just kind of thought we'd clear that up a little bit. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you very much for your your great talk. I'll get a hold of you here, email in the next day or so. Yeah, um, no problem. Anybody else have questions? I'm going to drop off here. Okay. Thanks, Steve. I, there might be one more question. I, I before I look for it though, I'm going to comment. We are recording this talk and. It should be available. Um, I will email it to the members, and then it's all going to get at some point, probably not very in the far future, will be on our YouTube channel. Great. Yeah. That more the merrier, right? Yeah. It, and, it looks uh, like there's one more question I'll address, if that's okay, uh, from an anonymous attendee. It says, why a smile? Why not a straight line? And I know exactly what they're talking about, I do believe. Um, when you look at Southern Idaho, the Snake River Plain shows up as more of a smile, an arc across the southern part of the state. And if you think about or remember my my map of the hotspot migration, it's more or less a linear trend. And the reason that it's not a smile or that it's um, why it shows up as a smile and not a straight line is two things. Um, the track of the volcanic fields is more or less a straight line. So that data is there. The smile though you see is topography. And so it's two different things. The, the chain of volcanoes gets younger from Southwestern Idaho to Northeastern or, or to, yeah, North, well, to, to Yellowstone across the state. That's the progression of volcanoes. But the topography of Southern Idaho forms a smile. And that's because Starting just west of Twin Falls and heading up towards Boise, uh, that's what we call the Western Snake River Plain. And the Western Snake River Plain is not on the track of the hotspot. It's actually a structural feature. So it's a basin and range extensional feature. It's a graben, which means it's a fault, a down faulted region. There are faults just to the northeast of Boise. There are faults across the Snake River Plain to the southwest of Boise that have pushed highlands up dropped the western snake river plain down and that's why you see that smile so boise is not right on the hot spot track like twin falls is it's in a low depressed area that formed from structural extension across the region at about 10 to 15 million years ago so great question and and a really good observation uh, and i could spend 10 minutes on that but hopefully that's a, a good enough answer and there's one more uh, logistical question from Mary Helen. You can probably just read it yourself. Yeah, thank you. Great presentation. One site's picture had a parking lot with two accessible spaces and a clear pathway. To, um, yeah, so the place she's talking about, that was at Craters of the Moon. And that is accessible with wheelchair. And um, it's very close to the parking lot. That's at a place called Spatter Cone. So if you go into Craters of the Moon, there's a nice loop road there. They actually just finished or... Yeah, I think it's finished now, uh, a walkway out onto one of the lava flows that's fully ADA uh, accessible. And so they're actually working towards getting more of the features accessible to folks um, who, who need it. And so that's great. Um, so yeah, that, that place there does have two little walkways, no stairs that take you right up to the spatter cone and you can more or less look right down into the, the pit at the top there. So thank you, Mary Helen. I think that's it. I think that's it, Steve. You want to say anything about two weeks from now? Uh, two weeks from now, we have uh, Eric Carson from uh, Wisconsin Survey. He's going to talk about the uh, North, the uh, Mississippi, Upper Mississippi, and geomorphology up there. Uh, we'll have a posting on that at the website here in a couple of days. So, thank you, everybody. Have yourselves a good night, and uh, talk to you again soon. Have a good night. Thank you, Sean. Yep, thank you. Do you guys need me to stay on, or is that it? Uh, I, that's it. I don't see any I'll, questions. I'll, I'll email you myself here in the day. Thank okay. you. Okay, thanks so much for the opportunity, and appreciate you.